positive of the various institutions involved in filling our cause at this time. So I'm always very happy to be here and be part of this institution and part of what's happening here. And of course, this particular occasion is especially meaningful since it's in the midst of this Garvey exhibition and in the midst of Garvey centenary. So, as, as you mentioned, my topic for today is, is race first and you know, Garvey's relations with the communists and the integrationists. Now, Garvey, of course, represents the ideology of African nationalism, which is the most successful ideology among all people over the years. Most of the major, in fact, one of the major, the largest mass movements among our people, in this country especially, have been around the idea of African nationalism. Regardless of whether one goes to the 19th century or the 20th century, you find that the largest mass movements ever since free organizations developed in this country towards the end of the 18th century, you find that our largest organizations have always been around the question of African nationalism. Our largest movement in the 19th century was the Liberian Exodus Association in the 1870s, based around Charleston, South Carolina. That was based very firmly on the principles of African nationalism. Some of the founders of that organization were major African nationalists, like Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, Bishop of the AME Church. People like Martin Delaney, one of the major nationalist figures in the 19th century. These were some of the kinds of people who founded that organization, who organized it around the question of black nationalism, around the question of linking up with the African program. In this century before Gavi, the largest mass movement we had was the Chief Sam Movement, organized by a West African from Ghana who came to this country, and again built a massive organization on the principles of race first and African nationalism, and again physically linking up with the African homeland. In fact, Chief Sam actually bought a boat and took some folks back to Africa just about two years before Marcus Garvey arrived in this country. The Garvey movement, of course, is our biggest and most successful movement of all time. The Black Power movement in the 60s again represented a huge movement, even though it wasn't channeled into one singular organization. But again, so in every, in every epoch, so to speak, of our existence in terms of free black organizations since the late 18th century, we find that African nationalism dominates in terms of its ability to attract the masses of our people. So the ideology of our people has always been the ideology of African nationalism. Mugabe was one of the major exponents of African nationalism. He didn't invent it, he articulated it much more clearly than perhaps anyone else, and certainly much more, much more successfully in the way that he was able to channel his ideas into a single massive organization. And Gabi's ideas of African nationalism were broken down very simply into three fundamental parts which you, many of you have clearly mentioned before, namely race first, self-reliance, and nationhood. Those were the three essentials, so to speak, of African nationalism, the way that Gavi explained it. Almost everything that Gavi said can be broken down into those three very simple, very basic component parts. Race first, that we should look after our race or self-interest first, be it in politics or in economics or in culture or literature or art or what have you, or religion for that matter. Self-reliance, that we as a struggling people must always try to do things for ourselves that we can't afford to sit back and allow other people to, to, to assume the burden of liberating us. And thirdly, nationhood, but political self-determination, political empowerment was the ultimate goal and that the strengthening of the African continent played a very crucial role in the question of empowering African people worldwide politically. So that was in essence the way that Gavi broke down African nationalism. Race first, self-reliance, nation. The integrationists and the communists represent the two major alternative types of ideologies that have been put forward over the years in contradistinction to African nationalism. And you find that Gavi is the most successful organization among our people and as an African nationalist organization, 
was forced into conflict, protracted conflict over a very long period with those who proposed both those alternative ideologies. Gabi was also in the conflict, of course, with other groups as well, primarily the imperialist powers in the world, both in the United States and in Europe. So Gabi, because of his success and because of his firm rootedness in African nationalism, was forced to wage a protracted struggle on several different fronts at the same time. In fact, I don't think, as I have said last time, that there's another leader among our people who has been forced to fight so many serious battles on such a wide variety of fronts at the same time for so long. And the wonder of Gavi is that he was able to prevail because the man was faced with the most powerful forces in the world at the time, both on the right and on the left, all coming at him at the same time. And the fact that the man was able to build the most successful organization among our peoples in the face of that kind of opposition says something to the absolute power of God. Because he built his organization in the face of unprecedented and unequal opposition from all sides at the same time. Let's take a look first at the integrationists. Because in terms of Afro-American history, the integrationists represent a much more ancient tradition. Communism in terms of Afro-America is a more recent phenomenon. Integrationism, like that nationalism, goes back at least to the early 19th century, almost as old as black nationalism as an ideology in this country. Integrationism, I believe, in this country first became aware of itself and first expressed itself in a self-conscious way early in the 19th century. And there was an event that sort of brought the integrationists, you know, um, <clears throat> into this awareness of themselves, and that was the formation in 1816 of an organization known as the American Colonization Society. This was a group of white philanthropists, slave owners, do gooders and other assorted white people, who in 1816 decided that because slavery at that point in time was intensifying, because slavery was going into a new period after maybe a little love, it was going into a new intense period, and they were afraid that the presence of free black communities in various states would have a detrimental effect on the continuance and the intensification of slavery. So what they wanted to do was to find a way to get rid of free black people in this country. By getting rid of free black people, they figured they would remove a source of inspiration for the slaves, a source of support for the slaves, because the free black population, whatever their faults, the one thing that they always were very positive about was trying to do whatever they could to free the slaves. So this group, the American Colonization Society, formed in 1816, they took it upon themselves to try and get a piece of land in West Africa. A piece of land that came to be known as Liberia later on. A place where they could encourage free black people in this country to go back home to. The black community in this country became instantly divided around the question of the American Colonization Society. There was a nationalist element who wanted to go back to Africa anyway. They thought that there was no hope for the black person in this country in terms of freedom, equality, and justice. They thought that the only place for manhood rights, as Bishop Turner used to say, for the African-American was in Africa. And so that group, even before the American Colonization Society was founded, that group had already for years be making efforts to go back to Africa. In fact, they had already gone back, some of them. As early as 1811, Paul Cuffey, the ship owner from Massachusetts, had gone in his own ship via England to Sierra Leone to check the place out. In 1816, Paul Cuffey had returned to Sierra Leone and had taken his first shipload of African-American settlers to resettle in West Africa. This was 1816. Paul Cuffey died shortly after. Even before that, towards the end of the 18th century, there were African Americans in Newport, Rhode Island, who also were involved in an attempt to transport African Americans to Africa. 
So when the American Colonization Society, these white folk in 1816, came up with the idea, they were coming up with an idea which black nationalists had already been trying to implement and had indeed implemented successfully for quite some time. So as far as the nationalist element was concerned in 1816, their attitude was that they wanted to reunite with Africa anyway. And if these folks wanted to give them a ship to go, or provide transportation to go, then they didn't really care where the American colonization society was coming from. They didn't care what their motivation was. They wanted to go to Africa anyway for their own nationalist reasons. And if these white folk wanted to come and give them a ship to go, no big thing, they would go. <laughs> they, they, they weren't necessarily buying in to the motivations of the American colonization society. However, there was another group in Africa at that time who, because of the actions of the American colonization society, began to express what we now know as an integrationist kind of an idea. They said that they didn't want to go to Africa because they were Americans. They didn't come here voluntarily, but they came here anyway. Their blood and sweat, they said, was involved in the soil here. They had built the country willingly or unwillingly, and they were Americans. In fact, up to that time, all your black organizations in this country used to call themselves African. That's the reason why up to this day you have your African Methodist Episcopal Church, because it was founded in that period. That's the reason why today you have your African Methodist Episcopal Church of Zion. You had African Baptists in those days. You had African Presbyterians. You had African Free Schools. The Prince Hall Masons were the African Lodges and so on. All your early organizations prior to this point in this country were African. The question of integration never really bothered anybody. You know, the African was never a question. It was automatic. Nobody even thought about it. But around this question of the American Colonization Society, this group of integrationists now split the community. And you had this group now talking about being American, being born here, as I guess many of them were, not wanting anybody to send them back any place. They were Americans. They wanted to be part of America. And that's where you find your conflict beginning between integrationists and nationalists. This conflict intensified over the years to the point where by the time we came to the 1850s, the black community in this country was so polarized and divided that there, there used to be a, a practice of having what used to be called uh, Negro conventions every year or, or every few years, you know, whereby the black leaders from around the country would get together and meet in convention. But by the 1850s, the community was so polarized that the integrationists and the nationalists could not even meet in the same convention. You had the integrationists having their separate conventions and the nationalists having their separate conventions. That's how polarized the society had become by the 1850s, so 130 years ago. By the 1850s, the nationalists were again looking to find some way to reunite with Africa. And you found people like Martin Delaney and Robert Campbell from Philadelphia going to what is now Nigeria in 1859, looking for a place to set up a colony for African Americans. They went to a place called Abiokuta. They spoke with the local leaders over there in Abiokuta. They were given permission to come back and set up shop. But it so happened that the Civil War started before they had time to implement their plans, and of course, they all put their energies into the Civil War because they saw the Civil War as an instrument for ending slavery, whatever may have been the intentions of Abraham Lincoln. Now, the, now the integrationists were motivated by a desire to enter into the mainstream of the society. They had no basic problem with the society. The only problem was to try and reform the racist elements of the society. The society as basically structured didn't worry them too much. They simply wanted to be part of it, but before they could be part of it, they had to somehow get around the question of racism. So that was their main concern. <clears throat> All the organizations started by the integrationists, or to which they belong, were interracial organizations. Your nationalists have usually had all black organizations. The integrationists have usually felt the need to have white people in their organizations, 
In fact, to a large extent, the integrationists have often been involved in organizations founded by white people. White people have actually often founded the black organizations to which integrationists have belonged. Integrationists historically have tended to have a great dependence on white support, white liberal support for starting the organizations, for logistical support, financial support, and so on. Most of your integrationist organizations have, like I said, been largely dependent upon um, you know, white direction in one form or another. Integrationists have usually involved themselves in what I call protest politics. Like I said, they aren't fundamentally you know, displeased with this system as it operates. Their thing is simply to protest against racism in the hope that by protesting indefinitely, somebody will eventually feel sorry for them and allow them in. The integrationists have never had any long-range program. The kind of long-range program that you saw Booker T. Washington having, or that you saw Marcus, T. Marcus uh, Garvey having. Their thing has usually been just to react. Every time somebody gets lynched, they react. And as I, as I always say, there's nothing wrong with reacting if it's part of a wider scheme, but reacting as an end in itself is not enough, I don't think. And this has been one of the fundamental problems of the integrationists. And one can see the kind of problems that the integrationists have gotten themselves into over the years by looking at a man like Frederick Douglass, who was the greatest integrationist figure of the 19th century. Frederick Douglass, militant figure, born a slave, escaped from slavery, major abolitionist figure, fiery speaker, great, great person in many ways. In fact, the Garvey movement even named the ship after him. The SS Frederick Douglass. Yet and still, you find Frederick Douglass, after years of integrationist politics, after trying so hard to become part of this system, you found that by the time Frederick Douglass became an, you know, an older man in the 60s and 70s, that the strain of integrationism had worn off on him to the point where, in a way, he almost began to look like an Uncle Tom in many ways. You know, the, the, the desire, the sacrifices he had to make to try to gain acceptance took such a heavy toll. Because whereas the nationalist is about dignity for the race and freedom, justice, and equality based on dignity, the integrationists, by depending so much on white philanthropy and white liberal uh, support and so on, often gets to the point, like I say, where, where compromises have to be made. And so you, you find Frederick Douglass, a man with his background, at the, at the height of his professional life, you find Frederick Douglass appointed to a United States Commission to Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic. And you find Frederick Douglass being the only black member of this government delegation to the Dominican Republic. And you find Frederick Douglass on a ship, a U.S. ship, coming back from the Dominican Republic to the U.S. of A. And you find him being Jim Crow. Here is a United States, an official United States delegation to a foreign country. You know? these, these people all have diplomatic standing. The man is on a United States government ship returning to the States within the shadow of the of the White House, he's almost, you know, on the Potomac or somewhere on, on, on the way home. And this man is Jim Crow. He can't eat in the same dining room at the same time as the white members of the commission. And the man accepts it. He doesn't say anything. He just accepts it. You know, what well, one couldn't think of a nationalist leader accepting that kind of treatment. But, but the man, you know, he had been so steeped over the years in in, in, in trying to, to, to you know, make personal kinds of compromises in an effort to, to gain this integrationist uh, you know, um, mirage, but you find him making unacceptable compromises. Not that he could have done, done anything necessarily physically if, if the Jim Crow didn't. I'm sure he could himself you know, shoot everybody in the boat and in the system. But still, I mean, the, the way, the abject way in which he acquiesced in what happened you know, was most distressing to somebody with Frederick Douglass's background. You find the same thing happening over and over to Frederick Douglass, you know, at that point of his life. You find him into the Republican Party to such an extent. But where, whenever the Republican Party comes down with anything racist, you find Frederick Douglass, of all people, being the one to either keep quiet or to try and rationalize what they did and so on.
But Frederick Douglass, to my mind, represents you know, uh, one of the more poignant and unfortunate examples of the toll that this integrationist desire can take on our leaders if they aren't very strong and very careful. By the time we came to the 20th century, the major integrationist figure was our good friend Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois was a man who was the first African American to obtain a PhD from Harvard University in 1895. He was a major scholar, a major literary figure, a major writer, a major all kinds of things. He was very vocal. He had attacked Booker T. Washington for years. He had founded the Niagara Movement in 1905, which was basically a protest movement along the lines that I described. It had no program except to protest everything every time something happened. After two or three years, it kind of gradually you know, halfway disappeared until the NAACP was started by white liberals and Jewish liberals in uh, 1909. And Du Bois was, in a way, revived by the NAACP. The NAACP revived him and gave him a forum to again make his voice felt. It has been said of Du Bois by none other than a white official of the NAACP that everything he got in life was provided by white people. In fact, it's very fascinating to find a white member of the NAACP, someone who was Du Bois' fellow board member on the NAACP, making this kind of a statement. And what this suggests is that even the white liberals with whom Du Bois and others like him worked, like him worked, were behind the scenes, you know, uh, somewhat despising in their attitudes towards him, even though he was forced to make the kinds of compromises sometimes that a Frederick Douglass might have made, Still, the very persons who were forcing him into those kinds of undignified situations themselves, behind his back, you know, could, could, uh, could, could despise and show great contempt, you know, for him. They were using him, but they didn't respect him. And you could contrast that situation with a Marcus Garvey, who they might have hated, but who they were forced to respect. The boys they might have loved, but might have treated with contempt. And in many ways, that sums up the kind of the kind of choice that integrationists and nationalists often have to make. They will love you and treat you with contempt, or they will hate you and respect you. Which, which do you prefer? Take your choice. <laughs> do you want dignity and have to fight them for the next hundred years? Or do you want to be a good Negro? Let them love you to death, but secretly, or maybe not even so secretly, despise you. Clearly, they despise Frederick Douglass. Why would the U.S. government send Patrick Douglas with an official delegation to a foreign country and turn around and Jim Crow him on the very boat? That's contempt. Now, Du Bois was a very mixed-up individual, and it's unfortunate that this mixed-up individual became, in many ways, the embodiment, the main force in the integrationist world, you know, in terms of the attacks on Gavi and so on. Du Bois was himself of mixed racial origin in his various autobiographies. He wrote three autobiographies. He talks about his various background and so on. He usually talks a bit more about the European side of his background than he does about the African side, but he does talk about both sides. He was very light in complexion, nothing wrong with that per se. But for Du Bois personally, this caused all kinds of conflicts. They didn't have to, but just because of the individual that Du Bois was, they seemed to, you know, seemed to have caused all kinds of conflicts. Du Bois was described by E. Franklin Frazier, famous Afro-American sociologist, as a marginal man, what sociologists call a marginal man. That is somebody who was kind of caught on the periphery of two societies and couldn't figure out which one he belonged to, kind of a thing. As Franklin Frazier said, on the one hand, Du Bois was a fine fro of Western education, PhD Harvard, studied in Germany and stuff. He had the best professors that white America and white Europe could offer and so on. He was a bright individual. He did, you know, he actually exceeded them intellectually in their own institutions and so on. And yes, then he was forced to deal with the indignities heaped upon our people. And whereas for other folks, this might not necessarily have been a major problem for Du Bois somehow it became a major problem, and he was never able to reconcile this situation. 
he talks in his various books about having two identities, you know, one American and one Negro, as he called it, and so on, you know. Right, but you know, he, you know, he, he, had, he had a peculiar problem. In fact, let me just read what Franklin Fisher said, because this, this is very fascinating. So Franklin Fisher wasn't necessarily any paragon of virtue either. He was a little mixed up himself. In fact, it's very unfortunate, but it was a Jewish uh, anthropologist, Hirskowitz, who actually was a little more correct than Fraser, when they had a debate going concerning how African, you know, were Afro African Americans. Fraser was saying we were Americans, uh, and this Jewish anthropologist, Hirskowitz, was saying, well, no, you know, there's, there's a lot of African retentions in our culture and so on. But Whatever Fraser's problems, what he said about Du Bois is very, perspective, very uh, perceptive. Let me just read a little bit about what Fraser said here about Du Bois. But what he's saying about Du Bois personally, in a way, is, you know, could be applicable to, to many of the integrationist leaders who found themselves in this kind of strange no man's land between two categories. Quote, he was born in New England. This is Fraser on Du Bois. He was born in New England, where his mulatto characteristics permitted him a large degree of participation in the life of the white world. During his short, short sojourn in the South as an undergraduate at Fisk University, where he was under New England white teachers, he never was thoroughly assimilated into Negro life. His return to New England afforded him a more congenial environment where he thoroughly absorbed the genteel intellectual tradition of Harvard. But Du Bois, aristocrat in bearing and in sympathies, was in fact a cultural hybrid, or what sociologists call a marginal man. Once back in America and Atlanta, he was just a nigger fine flower of Western culture. He had here the same status as the crudest, semi-barbarous Negro in the South. In the souls of black folk, we have a classic statement of the marginal man with his double consciousness. On the one hand, sensitive to every slight concerning the Negro and feeling on the other hand, little kinship or real sympathy for the great mass of crude, uncouth black peasants with whom he was identified. For in spite of the way in which Du Bois has written concerning the masses, he has no real sympathetic understanding of them. The soul of black folk is a masterly portrayal of Du Bois' soul, and not a real picture of the black masses. And so, Frazier continues. So this was Du Bois, the mixed up Du Bois, who spearheaded the integrationist onslaught against Marcus Garvey. Now what were the integrationist objections to Garvey? From what I've said already, many of the objections will be implicit in what I've said. But let's look more specifically at some of the precise problems of the integrationists thought they had with Marcus Garvey. The first problem the integrationists had with Garvey was Garvey's color. Problem of race and color. Mm -hmm. They couldn't deal with Garvey, he was too black to be a leader mm -hmm. in this country. Garvey says in the philosophy and opinion that when he came to this country, he went to the NAACP office on Fifth Avenue. And he says he was greatly perturbed, distressed, he was taken aback by what he saw. It wasn't what he expected. He said when he went to the NAACP office on Fifth Avenue, he couldn't tell whether it was a, a white side show or a colored vaudeville they were having down there. But he didn't see too many black people. And the black people he saw were almost indistinguishable from the white people. Now, Du Bois, if you read Du Bois's books, any of his books, you can read The Souls of Black Folk, you can read his autobiography. You will find within the first few pages, you can't help but notice, you will find in Du Bois's books a certain preoccupation, a very unhealthy, almost a sick preoccupation with the question of shades of color within the race. It, 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 it's very marked, it's, it's sick. He can't talk about any black person without describing how light they were, 
or how dark they were, or what shade of black they were, or what shade of brown, or how curly their hair was, or whether they had golden curls, or what happened. But, you know, almost every single black person in the media has to stop and tell you precisely what shade of black they were. And invariably, having given you an idea of what shade of black they were, he goes on to tell you whether they were good looking or ugly. <coughs> and the lighter they were, the better looking they invariably are. The darker they are, the uglier they are. And this is no exaggeration. It sounds funny, but I guarantee you, go and read Du Bois' autobiography. Go back and read it. Within the first 50 pages, everything that I've just said will be vindicated. He talks about a, you know, some girl he liked when he was pissed. She was indistinguishable from white. She had blue eyes, blonde hair, kind of stuff, pretty. He talks about some black guy who was his friend of fist or someplace. The guy had a crude look. He was black and looked crude, what have you. So when it came to Marcus Garvey, when the boys described Marcus Garvey as black and ugly and pig-like eyes and fat jowls and all that stuff, that was no, that was no aberration. That's what Du Bois have been doing ever since. Always. Let me read what one of Du Bois's colleagues had to say about Marcus Garvey. And this, this man's language is very similar to Du Bois's own language on Marcus Garvey. This is a man called Robert Bagnall. Reverend Robert Bagnall. Now Bagnall was director of branches of the NAACP, one of the highest ranking black members of the NAACP. Not only that, but Bagnall before joining the NAACP, had been uh, a preacher. He had a church up in Detroit. And shortly after Garvey came to this country, he tells us again in the philosophy and opinions that he was in Detroit. And he heard about this Blue Vein church up there in Detroit. And in case you haven't heard about the Blue Vein Society, Garvey tells us in the philosophy and opinions that there were two clubs that he encountered here when he came to this country. He says the West Indian Lights had a club called the Colonial Club, and the Afro American Lights had the Blue Vein Society. And to get into the Blue Vein Society, you had to be light enough so that when you looked at your veins in your hand here, you could see blue. If you couldn't see blue, well, you need not worry to apply for membership in the Blue Vein Society. And that's rare. That's rare. And the Blue Vein Society and these other folks were so serious that they even had their own churches. And so Garvey tells us he was visiting in Detroit and somebody came and told him about this Blue Vein Church up there in Detroit that the Reverend Bob Bagnall was uh, the pastor of. And Garvey sort of, you know, he decided to have a little sit-in. You know, in the 60s we used to have sit-ins, sit-in at Woolworth's lunch counter. So Garvey went and sat in, in this Blue Vein Church on a Sunday morning. And Garvey went and sat right up in front. Because black folk weren't supposed to be in this church. And Garvey says that when Reverend Bagnall was ascending the pulpit and he noticed Garvey in the front, the man stopped and he wanted to fight. And the man wanted to fight in the States because a black face was, you know, what was this black face doing up there in the front seat of the Blue Vein Church? The man wanted to fight. That's how serious these Blue Vein people took themselves. So given that background, it won't surprise you at all to, 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 to hear this description of Garvey by Reverend Bagnall after he became director of branches of the NAACP. Quote, Garvey, he said, was, quote, a Jamaican Negro of unmixed stock. <laughs> and he, Bagnall, clearly is part of his mixture, right? So he's emphasizing the fact that Garvey is unmixed, unmixed stock. Squat, stocky, fat, and sleek, with protruding jaws. Now this protruding jaws is no accident yet because this is the way that the white racist ethnologists used to describe black folk, so-called Negro, at that time. Up until the 1950s. That's right. If you go to the library right now, and check Encyclopedia Britannica, the 1950-something edition, I think it's 53 or something. Look under Negro, and you will see a definition of Negro that's very similar to this. So what you have here is these blue vein types within the race who had actually adopted 
the way of you know of the white racist anthropologists and so on. You know their way of looking at black folk. The Encyclopedia Britannica tells you that black folk, you know, the same thing. You know, protruding jaws and sloping head and you know, and the back of the head was jumping out. What they call it, octopus and big eyelids and what big eyes and so on. Right. So here you have Bangalore sounding just like a white racist ethnologist. A Jamaican Negro of a mixed stock, squat, stocky, fat and sleek, with protruding jaws and heavy jowls. Small, bright, pig-like eyes. Rather bulldog-like face. Again, he's turning the man into an animal, the same way that the white racist would have done in that, in that period. Boastful, egotistic, tyrannical, intolerant, cunning, shifty, smooth and suave, avaricious. That's Garvey, as perceived by the blue veins. So the first problem that the integrationists had with Garvey and his movement was that question of race. Right. Now this is not to suggest that all of the NWCP blacks were necessarily light or that all of Garvey's people were necessarily dark. I mean, there was a mix. Garvey particularly had nothing against anybody of light skin per se. Garvey said anybody with light skin was welcome in his organization. The only thing that Garvey had a problem with was those people like Bang North and like Du Bois who somehow considered light skin to be a badge of privilege. That obviously Garvey could not deal with. And there were the odd dark skinned persons in the NAACP too at that time. The most outstanding was this man called William Pickens who became a great foe of Garvey as well. Pickens, he was a dark skinned individual but he had gone to Yale University and stuff and he assimilated into the kinds of ideas of the Bruvain and the white liberal group who ran the NAACP. A second kind of a problem that the integrationists had with Garvey was a kind of a class problem if you like. Because to some extent, light skin color and class, not totally, but to some extent, the two went hand in hand at that time, you know? <clears throat> to some extent. As we know, the light skin element evolved during slavery, as you know. And sometimes the, the light skin element, sometimes were actually the sons and daughters of slave owners and so on. Sometimes on the plantation, they would be given privileged positions. They might be the slave driver, let us say. You know, they might be the artisan as opposed to just a regular field laborer. They might be the house slave instead of a field slave. But you had a kind of an economic difference building up between light and dark, even during slavery. And so when slavery ended, the light element already had a kind of an economic head start. Because many of them had gotten this head start from their white fathers. I say fathers, not parents, because 99.9% of the time it was the, you know, <laughs> it was the white man who was the one doing the race mixture up in there. So some of this blue vein stuff was also a kind of a class problem within the race. <clears throat> I don't want to overemphasize that point, but there was an element of that in it. All right. And so one of the problems that this group had with Garvey was a question of education, because education too historically was one of the privileges that went with economic privilege, clearly. The light skin element was the element in the early period that was more likely to have a chance to be educated or to go to college or what have you. And so you find Du Bois attacking Garvey on the question of education. You find Du Bois saying that Garvey doesn't understand the technique of civilization, whatever that was supposed to mean. <laughs> Nobody who didn't go to Harvard understood the technique of civilization as far as Du Bois was concerned. Du Bois said the same kind of a thing about Booker T. Washington. You know, Washington was uneducated this other year. And the unfortunate fact is that though he was bad mouthing Booker T. Washington, calling him uneducated and what have you, when he came back from Harvard and Berlin with his PhD and stuff, he still had to go to Booker T. Washington and ask him for a job. <laughs> so <laughs> who, was, who understood the technique of civilization? Right. You know, Booker T. Washington was about self-reliance and building a base, and Booker T. Washington had built such an important school that Du Bois himself, and it's right there in Du Bois' autobiography, you can read it. It just so happened that Du Bois got a reply from someplace else, Wilberforce University, and he accepted that before Booker T. Washington's reply came. But, you know, Du Bois himself says in his autobiography, you know, it, it, it would have been interesting 
you know, if Mohaki Washington's reply had come first, accepting his offer to teach at Tuskegee Institute. Another problem that the integrationists had with Garvey and the nationalists was around the question of self-reliance. Again, Garvey was trying his utmost, you know, to empower the race in every sphere, you know, to the best of his ability. And this is something that the Du Bois never really understood. I guess so, I don't know, for whatever reason, maybe so dependent had they become upon their little port perhaps, but for whatever reason, they almost looked with contempt in a way at Garvey's efforts at self-reliance. Self-reliance among the race became something to be derided. Instead of something to be looked up to and applauded, it became something to be derided. And so you have the case of, of Liberty Hall here on 138th Street. Gab Gabi bought Liberty Hall, it was an unfinished church that was being put up. The basement was finished and Gabi put a roof over the basement. It was a large structure, you know, 5,000 people could hold in there on a Sunday night and so on. And it became Liberty Hall, the meeting place of the UNIA, owned by the Gabi organization. And Du Bois criticized Liberty Hall, he called it a low, rambling building, you know, dirty, this, that and the other. And Gavi was forced to tell him that, you know, all the other buildings in the area that Du Bois had said he liked were actually white-owned buildings, right. even though they were in Harlem. Right. And whatever the shortcomings of Liberty Hall, it at least represented black self-reliance. Right. And this is something that Du Bois and the integrationists could never understand. Another problem that they had with Gavi and the nationalists was the question of Gavi's style. Now, there were a lot of intellectuals, black intellectuals in Gavi's movement, contrary to what is often thought. You know, you often hear that the intellectuals didn't like Gavi. That's not true. The integrationist intellectuals didn't like Gavi. They're the ones who harassed Gavi. But many of the intellectuals had enough sense to realize that what Gavi was saying was the truth. Yes, sir. And even though many of them had supported Du Bois earlier, once Gavi came on the scene, many of them then, you know, um, threw in their lot with Gavi. Some of Afro America's greatest intellectual figures were in there with Gavi. Hubert H. Harrison, you know, one of our great intellectuals out of Harlem in the 1920s and earlier. People like John Edward, Edward Bruce, one of the major journalistic figures, one of the major Pan African figures in Afro America. T. Thomas Fortune, the most outstanding Afro American journalist of the age, bar none. The Dean of Afro American Journalists, he is called, Thomas Fortune, a man who edited Gavi's newspaper. Fortune dictated his last uh, Negro World editorials from his deathbed. That was the level of his devotion to Gavi's newspaper. Arthur Schomburg, who the Schomburg collection is named after, Schomburg was a man who, who uh, supported Gavi in his conflicts with the boys. And, and, you know, he, he went on record. He wrote in Gavi's newspaper. J. A. Rogers, and there are many others. So many Afro America's major intellectual figures were actually in there with Garvey. Those who, you know, caught the vision and saw the light and saw that nationalism was where it was at. However, there is no disputing the fact that the Garvey movement was essentially a mass movement. So whatever intellectuals joined it, they joined it because of their awareness of the need to work on behalf of the mass of our people. They didn't join it for elitist reasons. So I mean the main thrust of Gavi's organization was a mass, mass movement. Just as the main thrust of the NAACP and other integrationist organizations at that time at least tended to be somewhat more elitist and exclusive. And so there was something about the style of Gavi's organization that reflected its mass thrust. And that style upset the NAACP to a large extent. Du Bois, for example, accused the, the, the UNIA, Garvey's organization, of being, you know, of catering to what he called the lowest element among West Indian and American Negroes, as he put it. The criminal element. The mass of people became criminals in the eyes of a Du Bois. A criminal element. He couldn't understand why the mass of our people were so supportive of Marcus Garvey. He couldn't understand why the mass of our people would get upset when somebody like himself would attack Marcus Garvey for no justifiable reason. And he, he considered this to be fanaticism, to be criminal intent, to be violence and so on. He claimed he was threatened. Some Garveyites he claimed threatened to, to beat him or do him bodily harm or something along those lines. He also couldn't deal with Garvey's 
boldness in wearing robes on certain occasions, on bestowing titles to worthy members of the race. Now Gavi bestowed titles, he knighted some people, they were Dukes of the Nile, Duke of Uganda, what have you. And the boys and these folks became very upset with that, they couldn't deal with it. If you were Duke of York or Duke of Kent or Wales or someplace, Prince of Wales, no problem. But Duke of Uganda and the Nile, you know, the boys had a serious problem with that. He laughed at God, he called him a buffoon, a fool, a clown. But Garvey's response was, who gave the white man any monopoly on, on orders, on awards? Right. You know, why can't we decide who our heroes are, as he said in African fundamentalism, and show appreciation to our heroes? Yes, sir. And that's all that Garvey was about. Yes, sir. And if Garvey dressed in uniforms on certain occasions, and Garvey didn't walk up and down the streets of Harlem in any plumes every day, Gabi only wore those things on certain occasions for certain right. propaganda reasons. Those plumes and that uniform that Gabi had on, that's the way that sovereign heads of nations used to dress at that point in time. And when Gabi dressed in the way of the heads of sovereign nations at that time, Gabi was making a statement because Gabi was about nationhood. Right. He was about national power for black people. In fact, one of Gavi's titles was Provisional President of Africa. So Gavi's uniforms were a means of propagandizing our people to think in terms of nationhood. Yes, Gavi dressed in the manner of the head of a nation, and the UNIA was an embryonic on a nation. At a time when there were only two independent countries in the African world, the UNIA took the place. The UNIA was our provisional nation. As Gavi once said in 20, 30, 40 years time, when we, representing our independent African countries, you know, will be sailing our ships and our battleships and cruisers and maybe coming to pay a courtesy call in the White House, sailing up the Potomac and our, you know, African warships or whatever, coming to pay a courtesy call in the White House, the boys will still be out there protesting some more or other with some petition. And that's the difference in, in perspective right. that the boys could not grasp. Right. Gavi was talking about nationhood. So Gavi's style then was a kind of a problem for the boys. But interestingly enough, even though Gavi's style in terms of his dress and so on, his titles, were a problem for the boys, the boys praised the same kind of titles, the same kind of pomp and ceremony when he saw it among white folk. For example, in his autobiography, he talks about when he was in Germany and seeing the Kaiser, you know, Germany and stuff, in all his finery and, you know, in all his helmet and stuff. Oh, he loved it. He was loved it. When he went to Liberia in 1924 as a U.S. diplomat, all the European diplomats were lined up in all the pomp and finery with their swords and their uniforms, and he loved it. He said he loved it. Loved it. Once the white folk were doing it, he was great. He loved it. When Gavi did it, he was a buffoon and a fool. <laughs> what were the integrationist tactics against Gavi? The integrationists launched a hell of an onslaught against Gavi, as did all the other groups who attacked him. The communists, the integrationists, the imperialist powers. Gavi really had it you know, at, a, at a very intense level, all around. Left, right, center, all around. The integrationists attacked him. In the press, the crisis, the magazine published by Du Bois was a major instrument of attack, the crisis. Du Bois edited this magazine for almost a quarter of a century, from 1910 to 1934. And he attacked Gavi relentlessly in this magazine. At first he began attacking Gavi without naming him. He would write these little editorials attacking Gavi, calling him a demagogue, but he would never mention his name. Then in 1920, when he couldn't restrain himself anymore, he came out in the open and began to blow on Garvey, you know, calling him, you know, all kinds of names and so on. And pretending to be taking a very objective look at Garvey, you know, but in fact, distorting much of what he was saying about Garvey. For example, he wrote that Garvey had a wooden 
steamer, the Yarmouth Gabi's first ship, he said it was a wooden steamer, which was obviously incorrect. It was a you know ordinary steam vessel, uh, steam vessel. You boys and integrationists also relied very heavily on their white liberal support in their tax and garden. The white liberals controlled, you know, major American publications like the Nation magazine, for example, and others, and they were able to use that kind of influence. They also used whatever little influence they thought they had with government officials, many of whom too belonged to that liberal establishment. For example, you find Du Bois writing secret letters to the Secretary of State, telling him that you know, Garvey's a crook and, a, you know, and what have you, criminal. One of the most amazing letters that Du Bois wrote to one of these government officials was a letter in which Du Bois, let's take this out, Du Bois wrote, I forget who it was, it might have been the Secretary of State, but Du Bois wrote this government official asking him to please help him, Du Bois, to obtain a couple of ships so he could start a kind of a black star line, you know. He could start his own steamship, steamship line, man, to, to rival Garvey's line. This is Du Bois writing the government, asking them to help them to obtain a ship or two. This is after the man has been writing article after article in the crisis for two or three years, blowing on Garvey, saying he has a wooden steamship, the ships this, that, and the other. Garvey's a fool, how does he expect to run steamships? Then he turns around and begs the government to please give him a couple of ships so he can start his own steamship line. That's, that, that, that's the level, that's the level to which these people are, are degenerating. And again, it's very chilling, you know, it's very chilling to be a historian reading these kinds of documents because what you realize instantly is that human nature hasn't changed and you begin to wonder, well, who is writing these kinds of letters right now? And you can bet your bottom dollar that somebody right now is still writing somebody in government those same kinds of letters that were about somebody else, might be about you yourself, might be about somebody else, might be about Farrakhan, might be about whoever. Yeah. And as I always say to Uncle Tom's, they should be careful when they write those letters because many of them don't realize that these letters remain in the archives there. Those folks don't throw anything away. So in 50 years time, if they are dead, their children will be embarrassed because somebody is going to find those letters. I was going through the papers the other day of, of Calvin Coolidge, President Calvin Coolidge. I mean, it, it's, it's mind-blowing, it's sickening, it's mind-blowing, it's depressing, it's all kinds of things. I mean, the amount of letters you see in the man's papers from all these black folks, some begging for something, some giving him information about somebody else, some blowing on, you know, some other black person, some attacking some other black person, all trying to ingratiate themselves, you know, in, 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 in the Calvin Coolidge's company and so on. Interestingly enough, in 1924, when there was still a chance that Garvey might have been enabled to move his headquarters to Liberia, the U.S. government very skillfully at that point in time decided to use Du Bois to help to, to defeat Garvey's Liberian program. They suddenly made Du Bois minister extraordinary and uh, envoy plenipotentiary. You know, in other words, they made him kind of an ad hoc diplomat and sent him off to Liberia just around the time that Garvey was negotiating with the Liberians. And so, from the Bois' perspective, I suppose that his letters to the various government officials paid off on this occasion because he was able to go there and poison the, you know, the attitudes of the Liberians against Garvey's effort to relocate his headquarters to Liberia. These were some of the kinds of tactics that the uh, integrationists resorted to. When Garvey was indicted in 1922 by the U.S. government on that famous trumped up charge of mail fraud, the integrationist element at that point in time, they, 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 you know, they, they sort of mobilized their efforts. And this for them became a kind of a major opportunity. Because here was Garvey now very much on the defensive, the government had indicted him. And the integrationists at this point went all out to try and prejudice that case against Garvey. Within a few days of Garvey's indictment, the famous letter of the 8th, 
was uh, sent to the Attorney General. Eight of the leading integrationist leaders in the country. Several were members of the NAACP, some were Urban League members, and there were some others. Pickens was one of them, uh, Chandler Owen, who was a socialist, was one. Um, Philip Randolph was another. Um, this guy Abbott from the Chicago Defender was another. And, and, and there were some others. Right? There was a guy called Harris, George Harris from Harlem, who ran a little newspaper, was one of them. Um, du Bois helped to draft the letter, but interestingly enough, he didn't sign it. He had more sense than to sign it. But he was very involved with, 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 with drafting it. And this letter actually told the Attorney General, and, 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 you know, and just, just look at the situation here. Gabi has just been indicted for mail fraud. And in that situation, you know, the man's case is actually now, you know, it's what I call sub judiciary. His case is actually in process now. And at that point in time, you know, you know, you're not supposed to prejudice a man's case at that point. But that's the point when these fellows write the Attorney General and tell him that God is a crook. He's a criminal. He's preaching violence. He hates white people. He's mobilizing. Again, criminal elements among the West Indian and American Negroes, etc., etc., etc. And, and it's, it's in this precise period that the integrationists launch their Marcus Garvey Must Go campaign when they take to the streets, pushing the same line in public meetings and so on and in their press. So they created a climate which made it very difficult for Garvey to obtain a fair trial. Because there were no black jewels you know, from, from Gandhi's followers there, you know, the courthouse was a courthouse which was sympathetic to the NAACP anyway. The judge was a member of the NAACP anyway. So they created a climate which made it almost impossible for Gandhi to obtain a, a fair trial. Despite all of this, Gandhi, Gandhi still managed to prevail against the integrationists. He did manage to to amass more money from his followers than they could amass, despite their access to, to other kinds of funds. And this is one of the things that they were very upset about, the integrationists. They actually felt threatened. You know, Gabi's success in a way was seen as a kind of a threat to them. You know, he showed them up in, in, in a sense. He showed up their shortcomings in a sense. So from their perspective, I guess they might have been fighting for survival. The communists can be looked at as the radical wing of the integrationists. The communists are the radical integrationists. Their goals aren't that different, but there's a little extra little element here. But they're basically <coughs> radical integrationists. They too want to enter the mainstream. They too want to enter the mainstream you know, on, on an individual basis rather than from a basis of group strength. Gabi wanted to mobilize our people so that we could move forward on the basis of group strength. The integrationist thinks that he can individually integrate into I don't know what. The difference, of course, between the communists and the, reg and the regular liberal integrationists was that the communists had this extra element of class struggle. You know, their whole thing was based on the idea of class, class first. Their whole thing was based on the idea that the working class was a revolutionary class that the working class was the class that would inherit the earth. And they thought that class in itself was all that needed to be said, that the differences of race and ethnic background were largely inconsequential. Now Karl Marx is the man more than any single individual, of course, who is associated with this communist doctrine. There were socialists before Karl Marx, but Marx is the man who really single-handedly brought this doctrine up front and made it a powerful force in the world. Marx was a German Jew who lived in Europe. He lived in a society in which the question of race, at least as it pertained to African people, was not a major concern. Most of his researches were into the history of Europe. So his theory was based largely on his researches into European history. And there wasn't that much in his experience, at least he didn't allow himself to study that, those aspects, you know, which would have caused him to refine his theories, to, to look realistically at the question of um, African minorities living in white dominated societies. Of course, Marx was against capitalism, and insofar as he was against capitalism and capitalists, he would naturally have felt some sympathy 
towards any oppressed people of any color, and he did clear. But that in itself wasn't the same as uh, being totally aware mm -hmm. of the kind of situation which you find in a place like the United States of America, with its legacy of slavery and so on. Marx did make a few sympathetic noises during the U.S. Civil War. There's one expression that the communists always like to quote to show how nice Marx was when he said that labor in the white skin cannot be free unless labor in the black skin is free as well, you know, meaning that you know, unless slavery is abolished and so on, then white workers can't be really free. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this, it's like quite a fair statement and so on. But the fact is that Marx really never addressed or understood the question of an African minority living in a white dominated society with the legacy of slavery involved in it. Marx is said to have made a few racist remarks in his time, he very well might have, I don't know, it doesn't bother me unduly. Apparently some southern law office actually apparently was a, was a socialist with some black Belgian and apparently could be Marx called a man a nigger or something. But um, neither here nor there, he probably did it so well. You know, it's not anything that I wouldn't expect somebody of his background to do, and I'm not surprised by it. Some people seem to be surprised by it. Doesn't surprise me. There were some organizations in this country with Marxist elements in the years leading up to Garvey that tried to grapple with this question of race and so on. There was the Industrial Workers of the World, for example, the IWW, the Wobblies, a very radical organization, and they didn't do too badly. In fact, they did perhaps better than any other of the white radical organizations of that time. I think they may have been the only organization that actually organized black workers and didn't put them into seg you know, segregated locals. The Socialist Party that started around the same time, 1905, which had a Marxist element in the early days. The Socialist Party, despite its Marxist element, despite its radicalism, they were as segregationist as anybody else in this country. The Socialist Party actually had separate segregated locals for, for black members. In fact, Du Bois joined the Socialist Party for a while, 1911, I think it was, and then he, you know, he jumped right back out after a year or so. Even Du Bois couldn't deal with the Socialists at that point, even though he later ended his life as a communist, strange enough. <clears throat> the Communist Party, as we know it, was begun in 1919. The names changed over the years and there were different factions, but essentially, as we know it, the Communist Party was begun in 1919. That's the same year that Garvey started the Black Star Line. Now, when the Communist Party started in this country, they had very little awareness of anything black. If you look at the statements they made in the beginning, there are almost no references to the black situation at all. And where they did mention black people, it was simply to say that black people were workers and they had the same basic problems as white workers, and that, that was it. Interestingly enough, it was the communists in the Soviet Union. They were the ones who first alerted the communists over here to the need to do something about the race question here. It was Lenin and those fellows over there who, you know, in effect asked the people here, well, look, man, they said, the communists were supposed to be the most oppressed and so on, and, and the black workers over there, the most oppressed, you know, so why aren't you all dealing with it? So it was around 1921 then that the white communists here, spurred on by Lenin and others, began trying to find some way to deal with black workers here. The problem with white communists, however, in their relations with black people, is that however good their intentions, we have never been able in this kind of society to get around the cultural baggage, the racist cultural baggage, which they have imbibed as members of this particular society. So even when they were trying to supposedly help black people, they nevertheless very often ended up being very racist in their approach. Now, Gavi was about building independent black organizations. Gavi figured that we, as African people, had to be self-reliant, we had to lead our own organizations, we had to, to determine what our own program was. Now, if anybody else wanted to, you know, be sympathetic towards us or ally themselves with us, well, you know, okay. Now, Gavi actually expressed solidarity with most, most troubling people around the world. He expressed solidarity with the Indians, with the Chinese, with the Japanese, with the Irish, 
even with Lenin in the Soviet Union. As long as you were struggling against oppression, fine, Gandhi could express solidarity with you, he could deal with you, because that's what Gandhi was about. But the difference between that kind of solidarity and the communists was that they always started with the idea that they knew better than you did what was good for you, what should be the program you should follow to free yourself. They never approached any kind of a potential alliance the way that Gavi would. You know, Gavi would say, okay, Lenin is doing a fine job in the Soviet Union. I don't necessarily agree with everything he's saying, but I can express solidarity. But the man is essentially about the mass of his people in the Soviet Union. But the communists would not reciprocate in that kind of a fraternal way. The communists would say, well, look, I am the total repository of all correctness. I'm the only one who knows what's correct. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take over your organization so I can lead it along a correct path. And that's the way the communists approach Gavi. And that could never possibly work against somebody who was striving for black dignity and independent effort. And that was the essence of the problem between the communists and Gavi. Whatever their intentions and their practice, they ended up being as racist and as um, patronizing as anybody else. And this is why I call them the integrationists, even though they were the radical integrationists. They were just as integrationists and just as patronizing and just as anything else, as anybody else along the integrationist line. So, what, what were the communist objections to Gavi? His, his basic ideology of race first, clear. They call them bourgeois. They call them capitalism. I don't think there was a single real worker in the leadership of the Communist Party in the 1920s. They all go to Columbia University, but they were very quick to call everybody else bourgeois. Garvey was a real worker. He had grown up poor. He had worked his way around the world. Garvey knew infinitely more about workers. He had been a worker himself. He had worked on a plantation in Costa Rica. He had worked on the docks in London. He's a man who had led you know, the first real strike in the history of what was the British West Indies in the Printers Union in 1908. But some communists from Columbia University sit down there in his armchair in his ivory tower writing junk about Garvey being bourgeois. They call him capitalist. Why? Because he started businesses to employ our own people, to build self-reliance among our own people. That made him a capitalist. Now what short sighted nonsense was this? What kind of capitalism was that? All of Garvey's organizations, his business organizations were all corporatives. No one person could own more than 200 shares in the Black Star Line. The communists themselves had as much business as anybody else. They was, according to their own definitions, they were as capitalistic as anybody else. They owned their own newspapers, their own publishing houses, I mean, you know, so if Gandhi was capitalist, they were more capitalists. They, they, they probably had more business. But this is just shows the kind of opportunistic and, and basically dishonest way in which these people attacked Marcus Gandhi. The communist tactics were just as destructive as those of the liberal integrationists. One of their favorite tactics over the years is the tactic they call boring from within. Boring from within whereby they try to plant somebody in your organization and that person usually is a highly trained, you know, highly trained in tactics of disruption, highly trained, you know, a seasoned organizer and they plant him in your organization if he or she becomes very active at the local level, tries to be, you know, elected as secretary of some local branch or something and they try to work like that from inside, see, and start in leadership and then start making all kinds of pronouncements to turn the organization around. The main instrument that the communists used to bore from within the UNIA in the early years was a group of black radicals known as the African Blood Brotherhood, the ABB, the African Black Brotherhood. In 1921, at Gavis Convention, these African Black Brotherhood members, having come into the UNIA, then engineered 
to bring a white lady, Rose Pastor Stokes. She was actually a, a Jewish uh, communist woman who was married to Anthony Phelps Stokes, famous white uh, philanthropist and millionaire, what have you. So they brought this Jewish lady into the UNIA to give a big speech in Garvey's convention. This is the African blood brotherhood now borrowing from within on behalf of the Communist Party. And again, you know, one is amazed at the, at the kind of unconscious, the kind of unconscious content. Conscious, yes, but unconscious also content that these folks have for black people. Here was Gavi, the most successful leader in our history, a man with an organization in 1921 that spanned the whole world, 40 countries, millions of members, the greatest organization in our history. And this lady, little woman, this, this, this Jewish lady, came, you know, came, came in there and in a wonderful speech, five, ten minutes, she thought that she could have swayed Garvey's following to the point where she could call upon Garvey right there and then to endorse communism. She came in there and told Garvey's followers that uh, they should be communists and they should, you know, link up with Moscow. But Moscow would be very favorably disposed towards them. And Moscow was for the liberation of Africa. And then she turned around and called upon Gabi there and then in the middle of this convention to accept communism. Gabi was a great tactician and a great diplomat. And Gabi simply told her that you know, anybody was welcome to come to the convention and say what they wanted. But uh, you know, she, you know, it would be a long time before um, the UNIA would, would endorse the communist line. For, for those kinds of reasons. I mean, how could how, how could one join an organization which was treating one with such great contempt? There was a time during Garvey's 1924 convention when the communists decided to change their tactics and adopt a friendly attitude. They sent a reporter to cover the convention and every day in the newspaper there were favorable reports appearing. And in the middle of this whole rush of favorable reports praising Garvey, all of a sudden, an article appeared in the newspaper saying that the only reason they said why we're really doing all this is because we want to win over Gandhi. In fact, let me, let me quote it to you. You wonder if they thought that black people can read. <clears throat> now listen to this. And this, what I'm going to read here, this comes in the middle of this great campaign to win over Gandhi in the middle of his 1924 convention. This comes after several days of articles praising Garvey. What a great man. And this is, of course, this is after they attacked him for years. But all of a sudden now, and the communists are good at that, they suddenly switch. Make a 360 degree turn, the next thing you want to a different line. Then all of a sudden they change again and they want to some other line. And usually these changes are dictated by Soviet foreign policy. Not by any principled ideas of their own. So in the midst of all these efforts now, to woo Garvey in the middle of his convention, all of a sudden this appears in the communist newspaper, The Daily Worker. Quote, we are working with the Universal Negro Improvement Association, not because the president, Marcus Garvey, has improved enough or even changed at all in the last two years to suit our view of what the American Negroes must do to win their freedom. As a matter of fact, the reason for our working with the Universal Negro Improvement Association is because we desire to win over the masses organizationally and ideologically following this association for the communist program. So they're trying to win over Gavi and telling him at the same time that the only reason why they're trying to do it is because they want to win over his followers. So what kind of respect is that for the intelligence of black people? We actually say it in black and white, right there in the newspaper, that we basically playing games with you is what they say. You know, we just, you know, we're not for real. We're just playing games. We're really trying to get your followers, God. Now the communists, naturally, were an international organization. And so they were able to fight Gavi, like the imperialists, on a worldwide basis. Gavi had both the communists and the imperialists to deal with on a worldwide basis. And so the communists published the Negro Worker magazine, for example, a magazine which was distributed around the world in the Caribbean, Africa, Afro-America, and so on. 
and they would vilify Garvey in the pages of that magazine and all the other magazines which were distributed internationally. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, they called him bourgeois, they called him capitalist, they, 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 used, they used to love to call him a faker, a faker. They called him a misleader. These were some of their favorite terms of, uh, of, 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 of content and, and, you know, for attacking Garvey. One of the most interesting tactics used by the communists was an attempt in 1928 to sort of adopt some of Garvey's nationalistic philosophy. And this is the most amazing of all the tactics that the communists tried against Garvey. After having attacked Garvey for years because he was a nationalist, as soon as Garvey was deported from the country in 1927, the communists then tried to adopt a kind of nationalism. Again, the fool black people. They had a big congress in Moscow in 1928, the sixth congress of the Communist International. And they discussed Garvey for days, and they came up with this nationalist idea, because I guess what they were saying in effect was, Garvey had organized all these people based on nationalism, mm -hmm. so maybe the only way they could get to the people now would be to adopt a kind of a nationalism. And Garvey had just been deported from the state, so he had now been severed from his base. So they saw this as their great opportunity now to rush in there and fill this vacuum that supposedly had been created by Garvey's deportation. And so they came up with this idea of, of the Black Belt. The black folk in the Black Belt in the south of this country had the right to secede and to form their own nation, which sounded fine on paper. But once you began to look at the fine print, you realized that they were again playing games. They were saying, on the one side of the mouth, the black folk should secede if they wanted to in the south. But then they were saying that if black folk seceded by themselves, that that would be a reactionary state, unless they took a white minority along with them. <laughs> and they were also saying at the same time that even though black folk in the south were a nation and nationalistic and that was fine, Black folk in the north were not a nation, and the, current, the correct slogan for black folk in the north should be assimilation. So, you know, what did this boil down to? Nothing really. And they had the same kind of a program for South Africa too. In, you know, in this country they called it the Black Belt Republic. In South Africa they were calling it the Native African Republic. And the interesting thing is that the white communists in South Africa refused at least they resisted for a long time. They resisted Moscow's efforts to get them to go along with this idea of a native African republic. So what, what Moscow was saying was that just as black folk in the states had a right to secede in the south in the black belt, just so the majority African population in South Africa had a right to form their own African republic in South Africa if they wanted. And the white communists were the ones who were saying no. They resisted Moscow for years. Those same white communists, of course, today have um, thrown in a lot of the ANC and so on, but they, they, they don't like to hear that part of the history. They're highly intolerant to hearing that part of the history. If they have changed, well, you know, come out and say they've changed and, you know, and recite what they did in the past, but the way they deal with it, they just don't want to hear it, period. That's the way they deal with their past mistakes, but they don't want to hear it wipe it off the record. In fact, this happened to me in Jamaica a few years ago when I presented a paper on the Garvey movement in Southern Africa at a UN conference. And I mentioned this episode of the Communist Party's antagonism towards African nationalism back in the 20s and 30s. And the people who were in charge of the conference were sympathetic towards the communist perspective and they cut this part of my paper out. So when I got the Jamaica and picked up my paper and read it, this whole section was uh, cut out of it. They arbitrarily cut it out. So that's the way the communists deal with history. If they don't like you, you become an unperson. If they are ashamed of what they did, it never happened. Unless somebody, unless Gorbachev comes 50 years later and says, put it back in the history book, then they'll put it back. <coughs> so, 
The communists were basically then highly opportunistic. In fact, many of the black communists actually left the Communist Party in the 30s for this precise opportunism. The most famous, of course, was George Patmore. George Patmore was a man who had been favorably disposed towards Gandhi when he was a student here in black America. He was recruited by the communists. He went to Moscow in 1928. And he was the one who was used to write a lot of the anti gandhi propaganda coming out of Moscow in 1929, 30, 31, 32. But in 34, when the Soviet government again changed its foreign policy and decided to you know, abandon the black struggle, so to speak, because of foreign policy considerations, then even Padmore realized, after working for them for years, that he was actually being used as a, as a pawn. You know? um, and even he left the Communist Party in 1934. So Gavi then was forced to resist both the integrationists and the communists because Gavi was about African nationalism. He was about building an independent base. Gavi realized that our people could only get dignity if we control our own affairs. Gavi realized that you could not struggle for freedom, justice, and equality and depend on anybody else. Everybody approached our struggle with their own agenda. The communists themselves um, used, used to talk about us as revolutionary expendables. That is, people who they could use to push us you know, in, in the front lines, use us as cannon fodder. And as Gavi said, when the communist revolution took place and the communists came into power, we would have a communist state, but they would be communists, but they would still be white men. Mm -hmm. Even within the communist party itself, they themselves, after a while, had to admit that they existed within their own party, what they used to call white chauvinism. For some reason they couldn't deal with the word racism. The word racism used to stick in the mouth, so they found another term for it. They called it white chauvinism. So there are many lessons for us to learn in, in, uh, in Gavi. Gavi is about dignity, you know. People have to, we have to fight our own battles. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't have coalitions with other people. This is, and, and Gavi, interestingly enough, as far as the communists were concerned, he, was never, he never really fell into the sort of a bag of the reactionary, anti-communists. You know, he never attacked them to say. He resisted their efforts. He resisted their efforts to take over his organization. Yes, the unprincipled efforts. Yes, but Gavi was about live and let live. Gavi said that he, would, he was willing to use whatever good ideas he could find from any place. But he didn't want anybody left or right coming to tell him, you know, based on any idea of white superiority, what to do and what not to do. You know, he was the one to decide. If there was something that the communists did that seemed interesting, he might take that aspect of their thing. If there was something that somebody else did that looked interesting, he might experiment with their aspect of it. But Gandhi was about deciding for himself, for setting his own agenda, for interpreting our own reality. And I will end by reading two little quotes here that really illustrate the way that Gabi felt about both these groups, the integrationists and the communists. And, and both are similar in a way, because what Gabi is essentially saying in both cases is that both of them, in their own different ways, are basically trying to disarm the African. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to take away that initiative, that, that desire for self-reliance that the African has. Yes, in, the, in the case of the integrationist, Gabi is saying, the integrationist is coming, you know, smiling and friendly and so on, and trying to disarm us that way. Gavi is saying that when it comes to white folk, in a sense he even prefers the Ku Klux Klan, he says, because at least they force us back on our own resources and make us vigilant. They don't disarm us by their smiles. So let me just read what Gavi said about these two groups. First of all, they are integrationists. Quote, between the Ku Klux Klan and the Morphean Story National Association for the Advancement of Colored People Group. Give me the plan for the honesty of purpose towards the Negro. They are better friends to my race for telling us what they are and what they mean, thereby giving us a chance to spill for ourselves than all the hypocrites put together with their false gods and religions notwithstanding. Religions that they preach and will not practice. A God they talk about whom they abuse every day. Away with the fast, hypocrisy and lies. 
It smells, it stinks to high heaven. And now God be the comments. We have sympathy for the Workers' Party, he says. The Workers' Party being the name the communists used in those days. We have sympathy for the Workers' Party. But we belong to the Negro Party. Amen. First, last, and all the time. Yes, we will support every party that supports us. And we appreciate the attention the Workers' Party has given us in sending this friendly communication. But the communists have... But the communists have... But the communists have, but the communists have, but the communists